Hi, I'm Belinda Carley, the Director of the Institute of Personal Care Science. And in this lecture series, I'm going to teach you how to make your own makeup. And I'm also gonna talk you through different ingredients we use in makeup, why we use them, and how we get different performance or effects from different makeup products. We're gonna be showing you how to make uh, an eyeshadow in two different shades, a bronzer, which you can again also choose which shade you want, a foundation, and you can pick the color to suit your skin tone, as well as a nice red lipstick. Now, before we show you how to make these products and how the formulas come together, I just wanna take you through a little bit of misinformation that I wanna clear up first. Part of my role uh, as a cosmetic chemist and as a trainer for cosmetic chemists is to make sure we clear out any misinformation and dispel myths before anyone starts their training so that they're learning right from the beginning. So there's a few things I wanna make sure you're aware of when it comes to color cosmetics. There's so much misinformation on the internet about makeup and I wanna make sure that you understand when it's simply not true and then give you some resources that you can go to to find out and back it up for yourself. First of all, there's a lot of misinformation on the internet about color cosmetics containing lead and heavy metals. Please let me dispel this one for you first. Color cosmetics that comply with the regulations do not contain lead and heavy metals beyond tiny parts per million trace amounts that are proven safe. So we're talking about tiny, tiny amounts or none at all. That's what's permitted. It's actually illegal to exceed these parts per million input of lead or heavy metals in color cosmetics. And companies shouldn't be using colorants where the purity is not certain. So basically when these colorants are obtained from either mining sources or synthetic sources, they should be purity tested to make sure that lead and heavy metals aren't present. They can sometimes be present as part of the source where they're obtained from. And the purity criteria is set at such tight limits and it's regulated at such tight limits that lead and heavy metals shouldn't be present at all, or if they are, they're only present in tiny part per million amounts that are proven to be safe for our use. So if you see uh, government reports or companies being reported because they contain lead or heavy metals, they're breaking the law. They obviously haven't done the purity checks uh, and they haven't made sure that they're using pure colorants in their products, which they should have done that in the first place. Because if you're purchasing colorants from reputable suppliers, they would have done those purity checks and it means that the colorants are safe for you to use without having to worry about lead and heavy metals. So again, lead and heavy metals shouldn't be present in your colorants beyond very, very tight part per million inputs, which it's because they're naturally occurring in that substance, uh, but they are tightly regulated to make sure that these heavy metals aren't present there in the first place or at amounts that could cause you any possible harm. And if they are, the company that has them hasn't checked this purity criteria and is breaking the law. So it's incorrect to just assume that colorants and color cosmetics contain lead and heavy metals because it's actually illegal for them to exceed these part per million inputs. And it simply means they haven't done their quality checks and purity checks to make sure that they're safe from the beginning. So this is also important for you as you start to produce your own makeup, make sure you're always purchasing from reputable suppliers. Ask them for purity information and if they can't provide it to you, don't purchase from that supplier. Purchase from the ones that can give you the information showing the purity criteria or from reputable sources that you know many other small brands are also purchasing from. And that way you'll know they're complying with these very strict regulations and your products will not contain these substances as is the case for 99.9% .9 of compliant companies out there. And it's only the 0.1% that aren't compliant where we do find um, traces of these metals in excess of what they should be. I also want to let you know that synthetic colorants like DNC and FDNC colorants are not harmful. Now we're not gonna be using any synthetic colorants in the products we're gonna make. We don't need to, we're still gonna get some fantastic color from the iron oxides that we've got in our formulas. And unless you want some really bright pinks, really bold bright reds, or some really stunning blues, you don't need to use DNC and FDNC colorants in a lot of the makeup that you'd wanna create. Sometimes we use synthetic colorants as cosmetic chemists where we wanna create some really stunning colors 
or maybe where we want to stain the skin. But in general, we're not going to need them in the types of formulas that you're going to be creating. And we definitely don't need them in the formulas you're going to be creating in these workshops. But I do want to make sure that you know that they're not harmful. Anyway, again, they're another section that is very tightly regulated about the types of colorants we can use in personal care, the types of colorants we can use on different parts of the body uh, and different parts of the face even. We can't use some FDNC and DNC colorants around the eyes. We can't use some on the lips. And this again is to help protect safety of consumers. So where you are complying with the law, complying with the regulations, there is no harm from these materials. And again, if there is any reports or questions about safety, then follow the regulations and the product will always be safe. Now, of course, we're not gonna teach you about the regulations in this workshop series. It is, it is a much more advanced level of learning, but we can teach you that if you do wanna take the next steps in your color formulating career. And also if you wanna become a cosmetic chemist with us, but for this stage of your learning, I just want you to be aware that where these synthetic colorants are being used, they're perfectly safe for their use when they're complying with regulations, when they're complying with the law. Now we haven't included them in this workshop series because you don't need them and you're still gonna get some really beautiful color cosmetic products. I also just wanna point out that the iron oxides, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide used in color cosmetics are not all natural. Now you'll see a lot of misinformation about this out there in the marketplace and a lot of it has to do with companies simply not knowing. Cosmetic chemists know that they're not all natural, but a lot of times the marketing people in a company or the people promoting the product in the marketplace, they don't know that they're not all natural. They are naturally mined but then they do go through synthetic processing and they also go through some synthetic processing to ensure purity and remove those trace heavy metals um, and other contaminants that could otherwise be present if they weren't processed. So in other words, they're processed to make them safe for use and they're very safe ingredients to use in color cosmetics but they're not all natural because of the processing they go through. So it's incorrect to label your mineral makeup as 100% natural because it's not. There is some synthetic components present and I just wanna make you aware of that. Now you're probably sitting there thinking, hang on Belinda, I've seen uh, products out there marketed as 100% natural and their mineral makeup. Well, the marketing's not correct. They're not 100% natural, but like I say, a lot of times, the people marketing the products simply don't know. They do assume they're naturally mined. They don't check. And really, you should be checking before you make any sort of claims in the marketplace. And so I just wanna make sure you're aware so that you don't make the same mistake because you can't prove that to a regulatory authority. And if you are going to sell product or market it with the intention to sell it, whether you do sell it or not, it's important that you have every claim backed by evidence and you can't back this one with evidence because they're not completely natural. So make sure you don't make that mistake even if other brands are making them. But of course, iron oxides, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide is recognized by consumers to be a natural substance. And if a consumer thinks that from another source of information, not yours, you can't help that, but just don't you be saying they're 100% natural because they're not. So I just wanna make you aware of that so that you know from the start, this is not 100% natural materials and they're not because they're processed to make sure they're safe and make sure that they achieve that purity criteria to ensure consumer safety. So it's a really good thing that this processing is done. And finally, I just wanna let you know the cosmetics industry does not test color cosmetics on animals. There's a couple of cosmetic products that under regulations have to be animal tested to get into China. And that's a Chinese regulation. Um, this animal testing years ago, we're talking back in 1970s and before, was conducted to make sure that products were safe for use on consumers. Since then, they have done a lot of development in ways to test products so that they don't have to test on animals. They don't even test a lot of these products directly on humans. They do a lot of testing ex vivo or in vitro so that we don't have to put animals or even humans at risk to test safety of ingredients or finished products. Testing cosmetic products is actually banned almost unanimously around the world on animals. So we have got um, a great reference video for you to watch on that and information to help back that information up for you so that you can get a full understanding of cosmetic testing on animals. It's simply not done 
around the world except for the small portion of testing that's required by Chinese law if a product goes into China. And again, that's a regulation that is entirely in China and it's one that they're actually working to resolve and no longer have as well. But everywhere else in the world, it's pretty much banned. So we don't do animal testing and cosmetic products are not tested on animals anymore. As I say, they were tested in the past and that was to help ensure consumer safety. But animal testing has not been conducted in a very, very long time. So again, it's incorrect to suggest that your products might be better because they're not tested on animals because cosmetics in general are not tested on animals anymore anyway. So now here's some reference tools for you just so that you can learn more about these topics. Uh, and again, I'm really telling you this at the start so that when you're making your products, you're making them for the enjoyment of making your own cosmetics, that you can make them feeling safe about your choices of ingredients. And so that if you do then take the next steps and want to start selling the products that you create, that you're not misinforming consumers or marketing your products in the wrong way. We see a lot of indie brands, they start out, they, they sometimes just don't know better and they make the wrong claims and it comes unstuck for them. We wanna make sure you start out right with the right information. So here I've got some videos for you that you'll find very useful and we do have all of the resources to back up all of this information um, resourced in these videos as well for you. So first video is what is natural? So there's so much misinformation about there what is natural. So we have a video on what is natural and I also talk you through common cosmetic ingredients um, that people think are natural, just like the iron oxides and the zinc oxide example and they're not actually all natural. So I've got some of those examples in this video for you and it's just gonna help you understand what the cosmetics industry considers natural when it comes to ingredients uh, and what is not. And it just gives you a little bit more background information on this topic. Animal testing in cosmetics, this is a really controversial topic for a lot of people. We find that a lot of people are really emotional about this. Again, we don't animal test our products on animals anymore and we haven't for a long time and it's banned in almost all the countries around the world. So we've got a video here that talks you through, you know, how, how or why animal testing was conducted in the first place, how it's been replaced by non-animal and even non-human tests. And we've got that information in this video for you as well. Like I say, this is a topic that a lot of people get very emotional about, uh, but we've provided you with facts in this video so that you can see that it is banned in almost all the countries around the world. And there's only a couple of products that actually have to be animal tested if you want to take that product into China. Otherwise, you can't animal test, it's banned. It's just simply not allowed. So more information uh, on that topic in this video. And again, the resources are referenced in that video for you too. And then we've got another video here, how safe are cosmetic products? So it's an overview of cosmetic safety and regulations in place to help ensure consumer safety. There is a lot of misinformation about so-called dangerous or harmful chemicals in cosmetics and most of it simply just isn't true. In fact, there is actually regulations now in the EU that you can't suggest that cosmetic ingredients which are approved for use in cosmetics are in any way harmful because they're not. So where they're allowed for use in cosmetics, they're safe to use and it's been proven. And they're constantly researching and checking on any ingredients that might be questionable to make sure that they're keeping consumers safe. So there's a really good video here um, that runs you through that. And again, all resources are available for these videos for you so that you can get the background information and the facts for yourself. So now that we've gone through some of the myths, let's get onto the fun stuff. How do we make makeup and what do we put in there? So some of the materials that you'll be using specifically in these workshops include what I've got here. So first of all, we have titanium dioxide. Now you'll see us use this in the foundation and in the lipstick product. We use this as an opacifier. So what the titanium dioxide does for is that it actually gives us a white, opaque look. And if we want a lot of coverage, so if we were making a foundation where we want a lot of coverage, we want to cover freckles or blemishes, we use more titanium dioxide to get more coverage. Where we want a solid color in a lipstick rather than see through the lipstick, we use titanium dioxide to make a nice solid color. So we use it as an opacifier. It makes a white base that we can then put color on top of. 
and it helps cover any imperfections, freckles, blemishes um, that you might otherwise see because we're basically covering them with this white. Now on top of the white, we can add all sorts of color and that's exactly what we do with foundation products. Um, and we do that with iron oxides. So the iron oxides give us the color that we want. Now, one of the problems we have when we're making uh, makeup is the more titanium dioxide we use, and it feels very chalky, have a feel of the titanium dioxide in your, in your practical kit. It feels very chalky, it doesn't feel nice at all. And even your iron oxides, they feel very chalky as well. These do not feel pleasant at all to put on the skin, just as they are. So we have to improve the way they feel. And we use a lot of mica to do that. The mica we use in our color cosmetics helps improve slip. So if you've ever felt mica, if you've ever felt talc in the past, they're very slippery substances. And what they do is they help improve the skin feel of the product. So we need the titanium dioxide and the iron oxides to give us good color. We need these materials to give us coverage, you know, some solidness to the color so that we can cover the skin underneath. But we need things like mica to help make the product feel nice, otherwise, we just would not want to use them. Now, we use some coated micas. These are decorative materials. Now, they have a bit of a shimmer or a sparkle to them, and you can get all sorts of different grades. Um, the ones we're using in the pack, I've picked to suit the majority of skin tones, and I've created the different colors in this pack to help cover most of the skin tones of the users out there. So we've got these coated micas in there to give you some decorative effects. And they help give some of that shimmer to your eyeshadows. They give some of that reflective shimmer to your bronzer products. Um, they even give a little bit of shimmer to the lipstick rather than it just being flat color. So that's what your coated micas do. We also have uh, a small input of a coated mica in the foundation. And what this does in the foundation is it just gives a little bit of extra suppleness and glow to the skin rather than it being flat color. We've got a small amount of one of these coated micas in there to just give a little bit of a reflective property which makes your skin look healthier without the sparkle or without a shimmer, but it just gives that glow to the skin. So we can use all different colors of coated micas for different eyeshadow effects. And eyeshadows is one area where you can get really creative with after you've finished this workshop series. Um, but we also have a very small amount in foundation, so small that you don't see the sparkle or the shimmer, obviously, but you do see a glow or a healthy effect to the product that when applied to the skin because of this very subtle amount of effects pigment in there. So that's why we use those coated micas for different visual effects. And you'll see in the eyeshadows, we use quite a bit of them so that we can get a really nice, pearly, shimmery eyeshadow. And of course, as I mentioned, you can get a lot of different color coated micas from suppliers. So you can create all sorts of eyeshadow products and you will know how to do that by the end of this workshop series that you could source yourself and have a go for yourself. And you'll also see us use magnesium stearate. Now this is a binder, it's a binder in the products and it helps keep the product on the skin. So normally if you're just mixing iron oxides and titanium dioxide and mica, if you put it on your skin it would just fall straight off again. Like it might stay on for a couple of minutes but the slightest bit of wear or rubbing or even wind and it's just gonna come straight off your skin. We use magnesium stearate, it is a binding substance. Um, it's not enough that it clogs the powder. You'll see they're very free flowing powders that we're gonna create. But what it does is it helps the product stay on the skin. So the color stays on the skin and that's where you want it to be. You'll also notice in the formulas that we've provided you, there's no preservative. And that's because we don't need one. This is another area where beginners, when they're first starting out, they really don't understand when do we need a preservative and when don't we need a preservative. Well, you need a preservative when there's a considerable amount of water in your formulation. There's no water in any of these formulas, so we don't need a preservative. But what we do need, we do need an antioxidant. So in these formulas, you'll see that we've used an antioxidant and that antioxidant helps protect against oxidation of the product. It helps protect against it smelling rancid or off over time. 
Now, antioxidants are not preservatives. Preservatives protect against microorganism growth, your bacteria, yeast and mold. Antioxidants are actually a food source. They'll actually feed bacteria, yeast and mold when there is water present. But again, there's no water present in these formulas. So we use our antioxidant to protect it from any odor changes over time that would otherwise be undesirable. But the antioxidant is not a preservative, but it does help us give the products a good shelf life because it helps protect against oxidation. And if you didn't know that, it's perfectly okay because a lot of times when people are just starting to make their own cosmetics, they don't understand the difference either. So again, my job here is to help make sure that we're, we're teaching you straight away, even from this small workshop, the right way to do things. And that's why we have antioxidant in the formulas, but we don't have preservative because we just don't need them. Now you might be sitting there thinking, well, hang on, what about humidity? Um, and what about any um, contamination that a consumer might introduce to the product during use? Again, there's just not enough water, not even in a very humid environment for anything to grow in these products. So you don't need preservative. Now, in a moment, I'm gonna show you how to put your very first formula together. I'm gonna to talk you through the ingredients we've used, the amounts we've used, and then the method that we're gonna to use to put it together. And then you're gonna see me put it together in the lab. And then it's your turn to do exactly what I'm gonna show you. But first, I just wanna get you familiar with how to read a formula. First thing I want you to take note of is our formulas are not recipes. Cosmetic chemists work with formulas. We work with all of our materials in weight and we make sure that everything always adds up to 100%. Our formulas always total 100%. Now, one of the great things about working with 100% means that we can make really small batches or really large batches evenly and consistently because we're using percent. So if we were making 100 grams of product, we would simply use 1% equals one gram. If we were to make 10 grams of product, we would simply use 1% equals 0.1 gram. And if we wanna make 100 kilos of product, we can convert that easily too. 1% would equal one kilogram of each substance. So we use percentages because it makes it really accurate for us to translate the formula from very small right through to very large batches. And don't worry if some of this maths is a bit challenging because we're gonna show you how to do it with each formula. Now, a couple of things just before we get into uh, working with the formulas in this workshop series. Um, I wanna make sure you have some experience in how to read a formula. We've got this great beginner's cosmetic science video for you here. Now in this video, I'm actually making a mist product uh, but I do show you how to read the formula. So please make sure you watch that video. In this video, I do talk about adjusting pH. You don't have to worry about that. pH only matters where the formula contains water. And again, none of these formulas contain water. So you don't have to worry about the pH. Uh, that's not relevant to anything we're gonna be making in this workshop series. But if you do go on to study more with us later, that's a good introduction to pH and how we check and adjust it too. So this beginner's cosmetic science video here shows you how to read formulas so that you're ready to read the formulas. I'm gonna show you in a minute, but I'm gonna go through them with you anyway, and then you're going to see me make them in the lab as well. Now, what sort of equipment will you need? Well, working with color, you are definitely going to need some accurate scales. You can start off with mini digital scales like this. If you're gonna be working with a lot of color, I would recommend you get some scientific scales later, but they're not very cheap. So you can start with these cheap ones. They'll definitely get you formulating all of the products in this workshop series perfectly fine. And you can get these typically from eBay. So you need to make sure you get um, one set of scales that measures to 0.01 gram resolution and one set of scales that measures to 0.1 gram resolution. That's just how accurate it is. That's how many zeros. And this one here measures to 0.01 gram resolution. This set of scales you can see here in this picture. So that's the type of scales you'll need. You'll also see me just using some stainless steel bowls, which you can get from a department store, and you can just use some stainless steel whisks, which you can also get from a department store. You'll also see that I use stovetop, and normal stovetop is fine. Don't use induction, don't use gas, and that's because the heat distribution is too fast, 
um, but you'll see normal stove top that I use or you can if you don't have one already if you have only have gas at home then you can purchase electric uh, cooktops easily again online um, and they're the best way of melting and mixing which you'll see me do as well if you have a water bath you can use that um, but a lot of people don't have that so using a stove top is the next best thing and I do have a video where I talk you through the basic lab equipment you'll need to get started you can watch that here and then once you've done that watching we're now ready to look at the formulas and head into the lab mm -hmm.